Well, why don't we just jump right in, Mark? I would love it if you would share with the women listening a little bit about who you are, what your background is, and how you got into this thing called quantum thinking. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, obviously, my name is Mark Dawes. My When I left school, I joined the Royal Navy, and I was in the Royal Navy for 12 years. Uh, I, I left there. I got commissioned and became an officer and things didn't work out. So I resigned my commission and left. And that's a whole other story. But I was £4,000 in debt uh, and living in a bed sit. So I was in a position in my life where it was I was counting the pennies to either have a drink or half a pie or something like that. Uh, and then I got a, a job um, going door to door doing sales and Fast forward a few years, and I end up working for Apple Computers, and I became the second highest paid sales consultant in the UK. Um, now, I'm not saying that to impress people, because at the time, I didn't know how I did it. And I just, I'd gone from earning a minimal wage, if you like, from the Navy to being completely broke, then to have this phenomenal amount of money coming in. And I was totally sort of infatuated, if you like, with the, the fact that I was earning this money. No one in my family had ever earned that much money before. So I thought I was, I was a good businessman, which was a big mistake. So I bought a gym and I thought I'd invest in that. And that bombed badly. I made a bad investment and I ended up £80,000 in debt. And at that point, I was um, almost considering suicide, I, I actually planned to commit suicide because I'm very much an old school man, if that's the correct thing to say in, in this day and age, uh, I should be the breadwinner. And I wasn't. And I thought, well, I'll just end it all now and, and get out of that. And then I, I managed to pull myself through, I got a job as a prison officer. And then I became a hostage negotiator. And I was enjoying it. It was great. And then one day someone gave me a set of tapes. And the, the thing with, with being a hostage negotiator was that we had a very high absenteeism rate. We had something like 24 or 28% of people off with long-term stress. Um, and I started to look into this. Uh, so the, the Home Office sent me off on a course to become a stress consultant. And I was it, on this course and all these people were telling us all about the bad aspects of stress. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. You know, I've since I, I can remember, I've always put myself in stressful situations in the gym, competing um, and in work, and I feel great. So how can this be so? So I challenged their, their concept and I was uh, politely told to be quiet, but it got me interested in it. So I started to, to read up and I, I studied neuro-linguistic programming. That was my first step. And that was fascinating. And I found that what you could do with NLP is, is you could help people who they'd gone to psychiatrists and psychologists and all these people couldn't help them. And yet someone who'd studied NLP can take away a phobia in 20 minutes. I thought, well, this is un unbelievable. So that really perked my interest. Um, and then I actually set up a little business on the side of, of my employed role. And I was teaching martial arts and self-defense. And a lot of people were coming there who wanted to, to train, but they didn't have the confidence to train. So I used the NLP to help them. And then that got me thinking about becoming a cognitive hypnotherapist. And I didn't want to be a therapist. I just wanted to improve my training capability and my understanding of language structures and everything. So I studied hyp hyp hypnotherapy and became a cognitive hypnotherapist. And then uh, someone gave me a set of tapes from Tony Robbins. And I looked at these tapes and listened to them, and I thought, "Wow, you know, this is unbelievable. You know, I, I could, if I can use my mind, then I'm, I'm going to do that." And that's when I started studying quantum mechanics and quantum weirdness. And so, when people say to me, "What's quantum thinking?" it's it's an eclectic mix of stuff that I've just given a name to. If I'm being totally honest, um, and, and involved with that as well, I, I got introduced to a Buddhist monk. Because one of the things that I, I failed to mention in my timeline was when I left the military, I, I had a major anger problem. Uh, I would literally pick a fight with someone walking down the street because I felt so betrayed by the military. And a friend of mine took me to a party and introduced me to a Buddhist monk. And it was very surreal because we went to the party. There were people dancing and drinking and having fun. 
and sat in the corner was a monk in his Buddhist robes. And I said to my friend, is this a joke? He said, no, he's here for you. And he took me over and I sat down, introduced myself to the monk and he kicked me in the leg. And I said, you, you just kicked me. He said, who? I said, you. He said, when? I said, just now. He said, did it hurt? I went, no, because then he had little sandals on. And he went, don't worry, it's in the past, and carried on talking to me. I, th I thought, okay. And then a minute or two later, he kicked me again. And I said, you just kicked me. He said, who? I said, you. He said, when? I said, just now. He said, did it hurt? I went, no. He said, forget about it, it's gone. And he carried on talking to me. And then he did it a third time. And I said, look, I'm really sorry. I said, but monk or not, if you do it once more, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you on your backside. And he stood up and, and he gave me this slip of paper with an address on it. And he said, 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning, come there. And it was a Buddhist temple in London. So I went. Uh, I went because my friend made me go, actually. I wasn't going to go. And I went and I got to the door. And it was the strangest thing. I, I went to press the doorbell and I couldn't do it. And the monk opened the door and he said, oh, that bell never works for people that don't press it. Come in. And we went in and he spoke to me about quantum mechanics and quantum science and all this weirdness. And I thought, I said, I thought Buddhism was a religion. He said, no, it's, it's, a, it's a way of living. It's a practice. And it fascinated me. So he said, come and meditate with me. And I've never meditated in my life. And I, I said, no, no, that's going too far. He said, you have to breathe, don't you? I went, yeah. He said, well, we're only breathing. He said, you can keep your eyes open if you like. It doesn't matter. So we went into this um, meditation hall and we just sat there breathing. And I, I just felt so tranquil. I felt totally at, at, at peace. And it was like a massive weight had gone off my back. And this is the surreal thing. This happened in about 10 minutes. And he said, twice a week, every week now for six months, you come to me. Uh, and I did. I kept that commitment. So that was another aspect of, of you know, my interest was the, the meditation aspects, but all of it coming together, if it, it encapsulates everything about our mind, you know, because our mind is such a powerful thing and learning to understand that gave me a, a new freedom. It was unbelievable. Nothing then was, was a problem. You know, nothing was unachievable. You know, if we could think it, we can do it. That was the sort of mantra I had. And yeah, it, you know, you don't get everything you, you ask for, but I don't worry about the stuff that doesn't work. I just worry about the stuff that works and do more of it. So that's sort of a, a brief snapshot, really, of where, where it all began. I find that so fascinating that you could go from, you know, the, the Navy to top salesperson at Apple UK to the brink of suicide, you know, with the gym falling apart. I mean, what an interesting background and to think about how all of those things came together to bring you to where you are today where you have this massive social media following and you're getting people to start thinking about themselves about their mind and about possibilities in a completely different way and it's funny because what drew my attention to you was a video that you did about our our mind being the most powerful pharmacy there is. It was something to that effect. Yeah. And I love that because you and I see this in our own lives, but we also see it anecdotally that the mind and body work together. It's shocking to me that we aren't taught that from the word go. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. It's And the mind and body are intrinsically linked. And I don't want to get too esoterical here because we can go off on, on another tangent, but <laughs> there is no point of separation with anything, you know, when you, when you get down to the basic unity of things. And this, this three and a half pounds of equipment that we've been blessed to have between our ears, it, it's just amazing what it can do. You know, we've got 400 billion neurons and we're using less than 3% of them. So opening that up, if you could open up another 1% of, of your capacity, your mental capacity, you know, how much more, you know, happier could you be? How much more successful could you be? And success, you know, you don't need to measure success in financial terms. 
anyone that's following a worthy ideal is doing something they love and enjoying it, you know, that's success, you know. Uh, but we have a lot of, and, I, and I'm, I'm guilty of falling into the trap, you know, because for the, the last 30 years prior to me, and it, it was funny actually, because I, my wife and I ran a training company for 30 years and our main focus with the business was on dealing with conflict, teaching people how to deal with conflict and use of force issues, working as an expert witness in court, doing all that stuff. And we used to train people. Uh, and I initially started learning all this stuff uh, to help me, but then I was able to help people who had anxiety and worry on courses. And then during the pandemic, and, and I've always spoken about this on our courses as an introduction, but during the pandemic, when people were, were struggling with being isolated, it, it, I, I just came out and said, look, this is what I do. I meditate every day. I do this. I read. I study this. You know, try this. It might help you. And it, it helped a lot of people. You know, that's what they told me. And then I took early retirement at the end of last year. So this year, you know, we, the business is gone. And my, I had a beautiful dog who sadly got sick. And I, we had to be with him 24 hours a day. One of us had to be with him. So to give myself something to do, I just put my phone on, hit reel, and recorded a 60-second video. I had no script, no idea of what I'd say. I just thought I'd do that and we'll have a bit of fun. And it went mad. I mean, we hit 7.1 million accounts in 90 days. We picked up a quarter of a million followers. Um, and it was lovely. I had people emailing me and messaging me, asking for advice and help, and I was more than happy to help. And it gives you a, a new sense of purpose in being able to help people because I'm not trying to sell anything. You know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to make money. I've done all that. Now it's, it's nice because if you peel all the layers away, which is where I'm at now, you realize that success is, and everyone should be successful because I think when you become successful, you realize it's not what it's made. It's, it's meant to be, you know, and you realize you've been chasing a, a, a false sense of security for want of a better word. I think that's super profound because especially for the women that I serve, because we get locked in this trap mark that, okay, I just need to have this baby. Once I have this baby, my life is complete or, you know, all of my problems are going to go away. As naive as that may sound, when we get stuck, it's the same kind of trap that you're talking about, the success trap where you know, when I achieve this level in my business or when I earn this amount of money, I'll be happy. But the reality is, is the happiness does not come from the baby. It doesn't come from the money. It comes from somewhere else. Where do you think that is? It comes from within. Uh, you know, people think happiness is some sort of destination. As you've so, so elo eloquently said, if I get this, be it a child, be it a, a promotion, a new car, I'll be happy. And that's short lived. Because people think that you have to attain something to become happy. Happy is available right here, right now. Now, I'm a great advocate of Thich Nhat Hanh, who's one of the greatest Zen, Zen Buddhist masters I've, I've ever, you know, had the pleasure to, to learn from. And he says, you know, it's, it's not a destination. It's, it's here right now. You know, heaven exists here. And if you look at some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Gospel of Thomas particularly, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, if you think heaven's up there, the birds are nearer to it than you are. You know, heaven's inside you right now. Uh, this is what the Buddhists call Nirvana. You know, uh, but we, we get caught in this competitive and commercial cycle. Uh, and society's generated it because they want us to buy stuff we don't need. They even want us to buy stuff we don't even want. We just think we want it, you know. And for me, at, at this point in my life, giving I'm, I'm giving you know we we're sort of getting rid of all these shackles you know we just don't need them you know i mean i'm a, I'm a great biker i've been riding motorbikes since i was 14 and i just sold my last bike about a year ago and my wife only asked me the day before yesterday are you buying another bike i went no i, I don't need it you know it's just another thing it's not going to make me any happier happiness is here right now it's, it's just a choice i love that you say that because you know happiness is a choice, right? And like for the women that are listening to this, you know, some women really look at struggling with fertility or having, you know, certain issues with their bodies that maybe make conception difficult. They look at it from the perspective of, oh, this is happening to me. 
I must be being punished or this journey is, you know, it, it's hard. And I think while there, there are certain truths to that, I think that the, the whole truth is that we make it hard. You know, going back to what you said about choice, we can make anything, even the seemingly horrific, we can always find something in it, you know, for growth or, or things like that. I mean, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, after the Second World War, the, the Russians uh, were doing some experiments and they were talking to Holocaust, Holocaust survivors about their experiences and what made them survive. And some of the, as you can imagine, the, the horrendous experiences they had. But those that had a sense of purpose in helping other people, particularly, so they would, they would, they would put others before themselves and were grateful for the fact that they were still alive the next morning as opposed to being dead. A lot of them went on to be very successful and they, they, they're at the lowest point ever. And then they, the Russians thought, well, well, we'll broaden this research. And they started looking at top performers in the athletic world and in, and in business. And they found that most people who were successful had had their dark night of the soul. They'd been in that place where they had nothing else. They, you know, for me, it was not being a man and thinking about committing suicide, I suppose. But I've had, I've had a few others too. Um, and that's the, the point. You know, when, you, when you get there, you realize that it, it, the only thing that can get me out of this is me. And Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, he writes in this book that he said, I could be pulled out of a line by an SS guard at any time and shot. I didn't have any control over when I was going to be killed. No one did. He said, but I had control over one thing, and that's how I choose to face death. And that choice is the, the real thing. It's how, how we choose our options. And we have a wonderful ability to choose. So when I started applying this stuff in my life, the results were, you know, I mean, they speak, speak for themselves. You know, we, we built a business from nothing. I went from being, uh, I was 80,000 pounds in debt. I borrowed another 30,000 pounds to start the business. So I was now 110,000 pounds in debt. But at that point, I knew I would succeed. There was no way it was going to fail. Whatever it took, it was going to, it was going to happen. And we succeeded. We, we had a, you know, six six figure business, you know, multiple six figure business every every year for, for like nine or thirty years, um, and that was done even in recessions. You know, and because I don't do recessions, I learned this a long time ago. You know, the news comes on, there's a, there's a recession, and people say, "Oh, there's a recession." So don't choose not to do it. You know, you, you, you're not dying. You're not going to die. It's, choose not to do it. And I don't know a lot about fertility. You're the expert there. I'm not a medical professional, so I can't give medical advice. But I'm presuming that when um, a lady is, is going through that crisis, there's a lot of stress uh, on them, a lot of worry. And then what we do is, and you might think you don't choose it, but you're, you're choosing it. You're just getting very good at choosing it so often that it becomes a default option, is they constantly worry about, either not getting pregnant or they're, they're, they're just they're wanting so much to get pregnant that the want is actually working against them uh, as it does in business you know want, wanting something when you when you say i want something all you're sending a signal out to the universe is you're saying i i haven't got it because if you want it you, you must you don't have it so the universe will say well i'll, I'll give you more wants because you obviously want it so let me make you want it more you have to come from a position that it's already happened. Oh, I love that. Mark, if we could only put that in a vitamin and give that to everyone to understand, it would make such a huge difference. And, and you know, it's what you're saying is absolutely true because I see this. I see this consistently in women around the world. So this isn't just, I mean... It, there is a consistency that is undeniable that the more that we reinforce the lack of something, the more we see its lack. Yeah. And, and it's funny, that's true in my life because my dark night of the soul was when I was struggling with fertility. And I remember 
I was having a miscarriage. So Mark, I had a miscarriage on Christmas day. Okay. And I remember something in my heart just kept telling me that my son was coming. That even though I was having a miscarriage in emergency room number 13, if you can believe it, (laughs) you know, it was like all of these outward signs that, you know, things were bad for me. I made a decision in that moment to focus on how my son would come. He would come like I, I considered it done. I didn't know when I didn't know how, but I went from a lack of believing into expectation. And this boy came naturally, Mark, two years later, when I had been told for years, there was no way I could get pregnant naturally. And it was funny because I had my son when I was almost 44. So not only did I have a very long medical history of the inability to conceive, but technically I was much older. So I ended up being more fertile in my 40s than I ever was in my 30s. And that all came down to what I believe because nothing else had changed. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And what I say to you, to the people that follow you, is if we look at this physical three-dimensional body we walk around in, if, if you look at it through an x-ray machine, we'll see all the organs, you know, heart, lung, livers, kidneys, etc. Then you look through a dark field microscope and you'll see all the cells. And we're basically a composite of 50 trillion cells. If you then look into those cells, you'll see that they're made up of atoms. And 99.9999% recurring of an atom is empty space. So if you take all the empty space out of every atom that's in every human being's body right now, what would be left of them would be no bigger than a grain of sand or a grain of salt. If you did that for all roughly 8 billion people on planet Earth, the physical matter that would be left would fit inside something no larger than an apple or a tennis ball. But the atoms pop in and out of existence, the subatomic particles that make the atoms pop in and out of existence all the time from, from the void. So nothing in our bodies is permanent. We are totally impermanent. You know, every time we breathe out, it's a mini death. When we breathe in, we breathe in more life. 98% of the atoms in our body are are new every year. So if you think about energy, and that empty space is actually energy, energy cannot be created. It can't be destroyed. It can only be transformed. So every time we breathe in, we ingest new energy. Some of that, subatomically could be, could have been in the body of Christ or Buddha or whoever, you know, Attila the Hun, doesn't matter. But what nurtures the cells, these 50 trillion cells, what nurtures these cells is the way we choose to think. Because when we think, whatever, whichever way we think, good or bad, we'll produce chemicals in our, in our mind, amino acid peptides will produce those chemicals, which will either be nutrients for the cells, if it's a positive thought, or toxins for the cells if it's a negative thought. So if someone wants to, to have a baby in the context of what we're talking about here, I'd be thinking very much along the positive side, you know, as though it's already occurred. Because you can't manifest out there unless you've manifested in here first. That's the way it works. I mean, we have something like 70 or 100 million light receptors, uh, 7, 7 million light receptors on the eyes and 70 to 100 million at the other end of the optic nerve. So 80% of what we see isn't real anyway. When light goes in, it goes around various components of the brain and then comes back as, as, uh, as an interpretation of what we see. So what we see isn't real. What we see is a projection from inside our minds going out. So if we want to project something, if you want to have that in your life, you, you've got to start in here. There's no, no place else to start. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is so true. I mean, because you can see, I mean, I read Viktor Frankl's book as well. I love A Man's Search for Meaning. It's such a power. It's like, if you can maintain your focus in a concentration camp, you can do anything, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's fascinating. But, you know, we see this time and again, that the more, you know, our response to things and the way that we choose to think about things is literally creating our reality. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. And a friend of mine, it's interesting because when you kindly invited me to do this podcast, uh, I recalled a time, and it was a, about two or three years ago, where I, I was traveling up to the north of England and I stayed over at a friend's place to see him. I hadn't seen him and his wife for a while. And he said, we're, we're trying for a baby. We're, we're having you know, issues. We're thinking about, um, what do they call it? Um, oh, with IVF? IVF, sorry, but yes, yeah. that's the one. <laughs> I think about, think about having IVF. Uh, and I said, well, okay. He said, but he said, we don't know when the right, the right time to have the baby is. He said, we've tried and tried, and we, we're thinking about when is the right time. And it was just a very, you know, it wasn't a structured conversation. I said, well, there's no right time. The baby will come when it's ready, if you believe you're going to have a baby. And I stayed over at his house, woke up, left the next morning to, to go where I was going. And he called me and he said, uh, we just found out this morning my wife's pregnant. And I went, so that was the right time then. Now, I'm not saying that had anything to do with me, but even thinking about, you know, when is the right time, that's an, another stressor you're bringing into play, which is going to mess up the manifestation process. I think that's a really powerful thing, Mark, because when we think about, like, I, I think there's a bit of a dichotomy that people struggle with is that wanting something which we as we just spoke about a few moments ago like that kind of reinforces the lack of it but when you are in a place of expectation this baby's already here it feels crazy because that's not what we're trained to do like how often do we hear that you know i'll believe it when i see it but it's completely backwards yeah it, it is and you know i think we're this is the the problem is is the way we're brought up as children, you know, work hard. One day you'll have this, you know, uh, but you've got to work hard and you, you've got to do the physical manual stuff. You've got to keep going on the treadmill every day, and nothing is discussed about the power of the mind. And I remember years and years ago when when uh, I first started doing all this stuff, I was living in London, and I, I didn't want to live there. I didn't want to bring the family up there. So I, I kept, I had this book and I wouldn't tell my wife I was doing it. I used to go in the toilet and hide <laughs> and I'd write in the book what my affirmations were. But I started sticking pictures in there and I had a picture of a living, living room with a beam running across the ceiling and an open fire. And I had a picture of a black Range Rover, a brand new black Range Rover because I wanted a black Range Rover. Uh, these are all material things, of course, because that's the way I was thinking at the time. I just wanted to provide for the family because I got in so much debt. and. I imagined that there was a pub down the road that, that had a, a, an open fire and Chesterfield furniture. I was very visual. I stick pictures in there. And then we drove south one day and we ended up where we are now on Hailing Island. Um, we said, let's look at some houses. And we looked at a few and we couldn't find one. And then we, my friend said, uh, here's a house here. It's on a lovely lane, he said, but it's probably gone by now. So I said, well, we'll go and have a look. We went there and there was a hand painted for sale sign outside the house and it had been crossed out and it had sold written on it in white paint. My wife went, oh, it looks lovely. I said, well, let's knock on the door. So we knocked on the door and this lady answered the door. And I said, I'm ever so sorry, I don't mean to impose, but your house looks lovely. I said, uh, I know it's sold, but here's my card. If it comes back on the market, would you kindly get in touch because we'd love to have a look around. And she took a step back and braced herself against the wall. I, I thought maybe I'd scared her or something. And I said, are, are you okay? She said, we lost our buyer this morning. And I went, right, okay. So I said, can we come in and have a look? And she went, yeah. And we went in and the living room was exactly the same as the picture I had in the book. It had a beam running across the ceiling, had an open fire. And I thought, this is weird. And then when we moved there, six weeks later, we actually moved. Um, I, get, I get under my wife's feet a lot, so she always told me to go away. She was unpacking <laughs> the boxes. And there was a pub down the road at the end of the lane. And she said, look, go to the pub, have a, have a pint, and just go and chill out and leave me alone to get organized. So I went down there, and I walked in. And there was the open fire, and there was the Chesterfield suite. And I thought, right, there's... there's just something to this and that was 
proof for me, you know, uh, but once again, proof. Wow. I love that, Mark, because it's, it's so tangible and, you know, and I, I'm so happy that you shared that story because I think we all get wrapped up in this idea that manifestation is, you know, you've got to be meditating and levitating around your house all day uh, in order to call something in or that there's some right way to do it. But what you're explaining is, is get a clear picture in your mind and, and start putting it in a place where you can see it and have expectation that that will come. Well, it was interesting as well. I had an old beaten up Range Rover at the time, a second hand one. Um, it was within six months of moving that I went and bought a brand new black Range Rover. We had the money to do it. Isn't that crazy? You know, it's funny. It's like, I don't know what it is about Range Rovers. I feel the same way about them. You know, once, and, and I, I had one in my mind, like when I used to, and I was driving a Mercedes at the time, which is hilarious, but I would drive my Mercedes and I would think about my son. Like I, I would picture picking him up from school in a black Range Rover, holding a coffee, wearing Lulu, uh, Lululemon outfit, like super cute, you know, cute mom thing. And I kept playing that over and over in my mind, Mark. And it was crazy because at the time I had a Mercedes, I didn't have a, a Range Rover, but I kept my heart open and my mind open in expectation. And there was one day that I kind of woke up and I looked around my life. So not only did I have my son, I had my black Range Rover. I was in a Lululemon outfit, holding a coffee, dropping him off at school. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, like I knew that this, I knew that manifestation was real, but when you are kind of slapped in the face with it, that you're literally creating your reality, it's like you wake up and realize I have way more license and agency in my life than I was ever told. It's, I mean, it's both exciting and kind of overwhelming at the same time. Yeah, but I think the point, well, I think we need, I need to clarify with, with your viewers is you need to show up every day and do the work. You Absolutely. Know, you, you can't do it once and then hope it's going to happen. It's like going to the gym. You've got to do this constantly. And you know, a, lot, a lot of people, one of the questions I get asked is, you know, when you're doing this, Mark, do you, how long do you sit for and how long do you, do you meditate for and how long do you visualize this stuff? And I'll say three minutes at a time. And they go, well, you don't sit for hours. So no, because if I'm sitting there for hours, my mind's going to wander off. You're better <laughs> to do short visualizations and short meditations. Yeah. And I remember when I was working on having this Range Rover, I used to go to Range Rover garages and test drive black Range Rovers. I used to ring them up and say, can I, can I test drive the black Range Rover? And they say, well, why do you want to test drive a black one? It's got to be a black one. So I would actually physically get in the car and I'd have the, the that physical presence and, and that experience of actually having all of that sensational com sensation coming into me. So it was easy to visualize, you know, I, if, I, if I got home, I could sit there and I could just bring back the experience, but you, you know, you've got to do the work. And I was in the States uh, a few years back and there was a, a guy, a lovely man, but he, he'd had an injury and he got very overweight and he was having joint issues with his back and his knees. And he was a Christian gentleman. And I was in his van one day. We were, we were doing a charity event and I was going to help him set some things up. And I said, well, why don't you go to the gym? I mean, why don't you, you know, and, and get, you know, lose some weight and diet properly? And he said, no, it's okay. He said, I, I pray and God's, God's going to help save me. And I went, really? He went, yeah. I said, so you're just praying. And God's going to say, he said, yeah. I said, okay. And I saw this grass verge coming up. So I said, pull over by that grass verge. So he pulled over. And I said, if you came here every day for a week, month, two months, six months, a year, doesn't matter. I said, and you prayed to God that the grass wouldn't grow. Do you think the grass would grow? He went, well, of course it would. It's nature. I went, but God's nature too. And he went, right. I said, you can't just pray. You've got to take action. 
I said, God doesn't answer stupid prayers. And I call them lazy prayers. <laughs> you know, because if, if you can sit there and, and visualize this stuff, and, you know, and, and there's a process to do that properly, as I'm, and I know you know. Um, but if you don't put the actual work in to, to move you towards, you know, the, the, your goal, and because opportunity is going to happen. When, when I was visualizing everything I wanted and trying to manifest, something would just pop up. And it was having the ability to notice that as an opportunity and take advantage of that as opposed to letting it slip by. You know, and that's the key thing. You know, like, like The Secret's a great film, but people have got the concept in their heads or some people that if you sit there and you go, I'm gonna, I want a million pounds, I want a million pounds, I have a million pounds, it's going to appear in your bank. It's not. You've at least got to go and buy a lottery ticket and take a chance. You know, yeah. look at the opportunities that are coming towards you. That's so true because manifestation is not passive. It's extraordinarily active, you know, mm. because even in the example that I gave you, yeah, I mean, I, the way that I worded it was, you know, I kind of woke up in my life and looked around, you know, but I had been doing things every single day, even when I didn't want to do them, you know, mm. consistently visualizing, taking the action, meeting the people, speaking life to what I wanted, doing what it took. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. That's the part where, where I think people struggle with manifestation and believing that it's woo-woo. It's actually quite logical and linear, you know, thoughts, beliefs, actions, results, like actions is a necessary part of it. So mm. like, even when I, I'm talking to the women that I serve, you know, you can visualize having that beautiful baby every single day, but you still have to take care of your body. You get medical attention as you see fit. You see an acupuncturist. You see all of the, you keep everything moving forward. Because uh, I love how you said that God doesn't answer stupid, lazy prayers. And it's totally true. We have to do our part. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. You know, we, ha we have to be active in the pursuit. You know, and, and the other thing is as well is it's not grasping too much that it's going to happen within X period. You know, I've, I've never set a goal in my life. I, you know, when I go to business meetings, I've been fortunate enough over the years to be invited to speak at various events. And I normally upset set people there because they have someone on stage who said, you need to set a five year goal. And then I go on stage and they say, do you set five year goals? I said, no, I could be dead tomorrow. You know, I don't know. I just, you know, I get an idea in my head. Uh, I, I work on it mentally. I visualize it. I have the intention there. I have a heartfelt, elevated emotion of gratitude. I, I, I just act as though I've got it, and then I wait for it to appear. And they go, and that's it. Yeah. And then I carry on doing what I do, or what I need to do, to bring me closer to making that happen. Because I don't know how that's going to come. I don't know whether it's going to be an opportunity uh, where that someone's going to invite me to do something, or speak with a podcast with a beautiful lady like you, or. You know, I don't know. You know, you never know. And I remember I was invited to a meeting years years ago uh, with a, a large organisation, and they had a big problem. And they were having this discussion, and they had their head of health and safety there, who'd won numerous awards for doing what he did, and their lawyers there. And I thought, well, why am I here? But I was invited, so I, I went. I just thought it's an opportunity. And they said, we're looking for someone to actually do a specific piece of work in this area because this, we've got this massive problem. And the lawyer said, well, we don't know anyone that does that. And the health and safety specialist said, I don't know anyone that does it. And the chief executive said, there must be one person surely somewhere that does this. And I just saw my hand going up like this. And she said, yes. I said, I can do that. She said, really? I went, yeah. I said, I can't do it. Immediately, I say, I've got other work on the go. I probably start it in about six weeks' time. I said, but I, I can do that. And then one of the lawyers said, he won't be cheap then. And she said, are you expensive? I went, yes, because they had an expectation. <laughs> and she said, well, when can you do it? I said, well, six weeks' time. And this is honest, God's truth. I went home and I told my wife, and she said, do you know how to do that? I said, not yet. I said, but the good thing is no one else knows either. I said, so whatever I do, I'm ahead of the game. And I Googled around and searched around, and then I found one book. And the book was, I think it was about just under £100 to buy. So I bought the book. 
And people said I was bad. You're paying £100 for a book. It got me a massive contract. And I read this book, and it didn't make any sense to me. And in one page, there was a diagram on it, a, a flow chart. And I went, that's the flow chart. So I made that flow chart and adapted it. And I went back six weeks later, and I said, this is how we do it. And they, they were happy. And that one meeting with one raised hand, no idea of how to do it, turned into a five-year contract. It was a very lucrative deal. So what I say to, you, to your, you know, your viewers is you, you don't know how it's going to come, but you've got, to, you've got to have the faith in the ability that it's already happened and then mm -hmm. just wait for it to appear. Yeah, I mean, faith is such a critical aspect of this because it, it bridges the gap between where we are and where we want to be. Mm -hmm. And But you had to have something within you that was willing to listen to that hand going up and not like put it back down real quick. Like you had to be willing to raise, to keep your hand raised and keep answering those questions and say, yes, I can do it. What do you think that was? Was that faith? No idea. No idea. I, I don't know, probably at the time, and it was, it was many years ago, I was probably thinking this is a big, you know, they, they, they're, they're willing to pay me a lot of money, which I didn't have at the time. So I thought, well, if, you know, that's going to solve a lot of problems for me. Um, so it's probably a monetary uh, goal more than anything. But, you know, it's so many times people say no to things that they're absolutely capable of doing, you know. Oh, so true. Yeah. And it's, but they listen to people who tell them they can't do it or, you know, it's, it's out of their league. I mean, if you, you, you have obviously bars in America like we have pubs over here, right? There's a group that meet in these places, and they're called the Fellowship of the Miserables. That's what I call them. Because you could have had the best day ever. You could have got a promotion at work. You could have found you've conceived a child. You could be whatever it is, you know, found the love of your life. And you walk into that bar. And, and they're always on the left-hand side of the bar, by the way, because it's nearest to the toilets. And you go in there, and you'll be happy as anything. And they'll go, you look happy. Yeah, I've had a great day. I've, you know, this has happened and that's happened. Oh, yeah, that won't last. You know, and they suck the life out of people. You know, yeah, you know, you, you won't get lucky. And I think a lot of these people try and drag people down because if an average person, and I am only an average person, I only ever have been an average person, if an average person can achieve whatever their def definition of success is, that means anyone can do it. And they don't want you to do that. Because then it shows that they're not willing to put the work in. That's what I believe anyway. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Because when you go after your dream, then whether you intend it or not, it shines light on the shortcomings in their own life. And mm -hmm. it's, I think it's hard for people to face that. But, you know, we all have potential. And the question is, ultimately, are we going to take responsibility for meeting that potential or even exceeding it and that mm. comes down to choice so you know i would love to get your thoughts mark i want to be mindful of your time but i would love to get your thoughts on the concept and the subject of surrender because i get so many questions about this like women you know asking me but roseanne how do i surrender i want this baby so bad there's that word i want but I would love if we would just talk about that for a moment. Like, what is surrender? Like, when you think about that, what is it? And how the heck do we do it? It's a brilliant question. And I think to answer that fully, I'd have to talk about impermanence and interbeing. Because we, if we accept that nothing lasts forever, because nothing does, okay, in the, 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 the sense that we understand. I mean, energy will go on, go on. So when this physical body's gone, it'll go on. So everything is going to come and go. You know, the people we love in our life that we live with, one day they'll go or we'll go from them. It, it, nothing is permanent. So understanding that, it can be quite liberating. Because if nothing's permanent, why are you worrying about stuff? You know, and all the suffering comes from trying to Grasp onto something that you don't want to change, which inevitably will change because that's the way of things. Then you've got into being. And into being is the understanding that everything, not only on Earth, but in the whole cosmos, is interconnected. We're all connected to one another. 
everything is connected because we're we're used to living a life of individualism and being separate from others so you know she's not like me or he's not like me and i'm not like her uh, and that causes division and it causes separation and when we get into this dualistic way of thinking then it's very hard to manifest because we're, we're admitting that we're living in a delusion because that's not the way that things are the the ultimate truth the absolute truth is that everything is everything into is and into being with everything else so a leaf on a tree is my, is the lung in my oxygen in my in my body the, the tree breathes so i can breathe you know we're connected to the sun without the sun i couldn't be so if you take a flower every every element of that flower is made up of non-flower elements if you take one of those elements away flower can't be so you take the sun away you take the water away you take the gardener away you, you take the fact that bird hasn't dropped the seed if it's a wildflower and that flower can't be everything must interconnect with everything else for it to be so that's these are important things to understand if we're going to truly understand surrender so surrendering for me when I, when I consider it is if if I want to manifest I have I have the intention clearly set in my mind so I'm activating the prefrontal cortex and I know exactly what it is. I've got a very clear image of it. You know, I can smell it, I can taste it, I can touch it, I know it's there. But then we have to also generate a heartfelt emotion of gratitude for having it. So this sends a signal out saying, this is what I have. And the, the heart then, because we have more neurons in our heart than we do in our brain, the, uh, the heart then says, thank you for what I have. So the two are in alignment, okay? then all you've got to do is, is consider the fact that if you look at the quantum field, the zero-point field, heaven, nirvana, God, whatever the name is that we want to give it, time doesn't exist in the way we understand it. Time is a human construct. In our 3D world, time is a human construct. So the universe doesn't work on the same time frame we have because time doesn't exist there. So if you just say, that's what I want, and you surrender it, you basically let it go. It's gone. That's all it is. You don't keep trying to want it because the more you grasp for it, the, the more you're trying to bring it into existence, pull it into existence, the more you define the universal concept of impermanence, the more you're now going back to being an individual. And that dualistic aspect is now separating us um, from, from the, you know, being one with everything else in the cosmos. And I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a funny uh, story, actually, while we're on this was when I was writing one of my books, I interviewed an Anglican priest, a Roman Catholic priest, and a Buddhist monk. And I, I asked the, the priest, I said, uh, where's heaven? And he said, well, a lot of people think heaven's up there, but as I said earlier on, heaven exists inside you here and now. I said, right, so we have heaven inside us here and now, we can access it. He said, that's right. I said, um, apparently we're made in God's image. And the other priest said, yes, we are. He said, we're made in God's image. I said, well, God's a creator God. I said, God created the heavens, the earth, everything. I said, this is what you believe. I said, if we're made in God's image, we must be created ourselves. He said, yeah, you are. Yeah. So I said, well, if we have this capability, this universal power of heaven within us and the ability of God to create anything we want, what stops us from doing it? Does God, has God thrown a curveball in there? that makes us stupid or makes us not believe. And it was the only time the Buddhist monk spoke. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, God don't, don't, doesn't do that. You have to do that all by yourself and with a little help from your friends. Wow. Yeah. So if you think about surrender, surrender is the, the ultimate giving. You're letting go. Yeah? And when you let go, it's a liberation, it's a freedom because it already exists. I mean, you can come at this from the position of super, super position you like in quantum physics. Everything you ever wanted already exists here and now. We talk about entanglement in quantum physics, where you can take, uh, split an atom, have them separate hundreds of miles apart, move the direction of one, and the other one moves instantaneously. They've done it. They've actually taken one into space and done the same thing. So they, they're totally connected, but they're separate. And the reason that they're separate but still connected is we're, we're all we all inter are we all interbe with everything, so our thoughts inter interbe with the universe, and what we desire 
already exists. You don't. Have, there's nothing left to manifest. It's already there. You know, we just have to surrender to it and allow it to come, and not keep pulling it or trying to pull it into existence with a one year, two year, three year, five year plan, because there's no time concept in in the universal the zero point field or quantum field, whatever you call it. So it just comes when it's going to come when yeah, it's ready. That- Mark, that is so, I love how you explain that. It just makes it so real because, I mean, if we, if we put it in, in terms of fertility, my egg was already here that produced my son. My husband's sperm was already here. All of the things that we needed to call in our son were already here. Mm -hmm. It's already here. And, and I think when you lean into that idea that everything you want is already here, then you don't have to have that chasing energy. It's not the lack energy. It's just, yeah, it's already here. And time is not relevant because as you said, it's a human construct, which in fact it is. So it doesn't matter if you're trying for seven years or five years, whatever the case may be, that baby's already here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a fantastic monk called uh, I forgot his name, uh, Finyak Rinpoche. Uh, he was jailed by the by the Chinese for six years, managed to escape, and got to America. And he had gangrene in his leg. And the doctor said, "We're going to have to amputate you uh, down by the ankle." And he said, "No." He said, "If it gets above your knee, we're going to have to amputate below the hip." He said, "You're not amputating anything." He said, "If it gets above your hip, you're going to die." He said, "Don't worry." And he, he, was, he knew he could heal himself, but the doctors were, give, were making him doubt his ability. So he wrote to the Dalai Lama and he said, what should I do? And the Dalai Lama wrote back to him and said, you have everything you need to heal yourself within you. Heal yourself and become an inspiration for others. So he meditated for, I think, four, six, maybe eight, eight hours a day using specific meditations, uh, Tonglen being one of them. And he cured the gangrene in his leg. And the doctors, all the top surgeons, just couldn't fathom it out. But he, he said, I can do this within me. Now, that was inspiring for me because I had a heart attack four years ago. And obviously, the options were there, open heart surgery, have a stent, this, that, and the other, a list of pills like this. And I thought, no, uh, I, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll work on this myself. So I came home. and I started doing the, the Tonglen meditations and, and, you know, visualizing my heart healed and seeing it healed and, you know, giving gratitude for it being healed. And I, and I had to go back every three months or six months for checks, I can't remember. And the last check I had was uh, March just gone. And the doc said, we had to send your results back three times. I said, okay, why? He said, there's no scar tissue on your heart. I said, okay, is that good? And he went, yeah, I, I, I didn't know. And he said, yeah, he said, if you've had a heart attack, this scar residue that doesn't go away. He said, and here's the image of your heart the, with the scar residue, and here's the image of your heart now. It's completely gone. What have you done? So I told him, changed my diet, changed my lifestyle. So I took active choices. Right. Um, meditated, visualized, manifested. And he went, oh, yeah, okay. And I went, well, that doesn't fit with your medical interpretation. He went, yeah, you can't manifest a, a healed heart. I said, okay, well, you explain it then. But that's fundamentally what I did. I took a, I t- took a leaf out of someone else's book. But the, the point is, coming back to this, and, and by the way, going back to this letting go and surrendering, I had no intention of trying to make it happen um, quicker. I just thought it will, it will happen when it happens. I know it's happened because it's already healed. There's, my heart's already healed out there. It has to be. Quantum physics tell me this. Buddhism tells me this. All the, the ancient verdict scriptures tell me this. You know, I mean, and all science is proving now is what the ancient scriptures have told us for millennia. Yeah. So I just, have, I'll just have a new heart. So if I, and by the way, two two guys I I, I worked with and trained who came on on lecture tours, uh, came to courses with me and listened to my lectures. One had a brain injury. He fell over and got a brain injury, and they said he'll never walk again. He'll never speak. He'll be a paraplegic and in a wheelchair. He, he said no. He's now doing triathlons, open water swimming. He does marathons. Uh, he, he's talking. He's running a training company. And I said to him, what made, you, what, what made it happen? 
he said this. He said, I listened to you once, he said, and then I went away and studied it. So he took action, you know, and, and he had he had that power of faith, not just belief. Belief is one thing, but faith is much stronger, you know, because you can believe that, that a parachute opens. You can believe that, you know, if you put a parachute on and you jump out of an aircraft, that will open and you land safely on the ground. That's belief. Faith is actually putting the parachute on and going up in the plane and jumping out. You're, you're test driving your belief. And people, uh, I think, uh, and I don't mean this in a, in a discourteous way to a lot of people because they're probably trying hard, but people's beliefs are not strong enough. Your belief has to become faith. And faith means it's already occurred, which is what we talked about earlier on. And if you surrender that faith to the universe, anything's possible. Oh, Mark, I mean, this is well, first of all, I am so glad that you healed yourself so that we could have this conversation today. I feel so blessed and honored to to have this conversation with you and everything that you've shared is just extraordinary. And I know it's going to touch so many hundreds of thousands of lives of the women that are listening. And so thank you. And I appreciate you. And I mean, what a delight to have found you. And we're going to put a link to the in the show notes to your Instagram and all of your other uh, channels. And it's just keep doing what you're doing, Mark. You're such a gift. And it's just it's phenomenal that, you know, people like everyday people like us can see this play out in our lives and the chance to share it with other people so that other people can change their lives, too. It's just an incredible honor and gift. So thank you Amazing. for coming on and keep doing what you do no th thank you for inviting me it's been a pleasure i hope it helps and one last thing when i was a, a young man in the royal navy i went on my first promotion course and they said i was too jaunty uh jaunty is like a navy word for sort of flippant i was too jaunty uh, i didn't take things seriously and I, I will i will never amount to anything that was my first leadership report so if anyone out there is being told the same thing, it's not true. It's absolutely not true. And I like to to tell women to just give the naysayers the finger. It's a little bit less polite, but it is very American. <laughs> yeah. Love this episode of the Fearlessly Fertile podcast? Subscribe now and leave an awesome review. Remember, the desire in your heart to be a mom is there because it was meant for you. When it comes to your dreams, keep saying hell yes.